Book talk begins at 11 minutes and one second. Emma begins with episode 649. Welcome to Craft Lit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 673, Ripple. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by our lovely patrons at patreon.com slash craftlet and our YouTube channel members. This week, we would like to highlight Renee H., Amy Cannon, Julie Thompson, Jonna Rose Ball, and yes, my father and reader of Herland, Charles Hutchinson. Thank you all so much. We could not do this without you. And a special thank you to the two people who I just saw. I had to close the page again, but two people have already signed up for memberships over on the craftlet.com site. So thank you. Link will be in the show notes if you are interested in moving over there uh, with your uh, support dollars, because as I think I said last episode, everybody else takes a huge cut. And this way we can pretty much just pay credit card fees through PayPal. Um, and for those of you who are still trying to stay off the grid, and I know that there's uh, not just two of you, this is the way that we can once again start doing things like you can get a check to me. And that's how you can pay for your premium audio. So you'll have access to everything again. Yeah. So there'll be information on that on the page that's listed in the show notes. So this month, our raffle is for Continuous Cables, the fabulous book by Melissa Liepman. It's a real book. Uh, I love this book. I am going to be very happy for it to find a loving home. So if you are interested in trying cables, possibly free book coming your way. Also, along with that, we are going to have is spectacular and it is from Anne's Two Step on Ravelry. And wow, I cannot wait to share it with you. I'm very excited. So, yeah, Halloween y specialness. And you're just going to have to wait until the first episode that comes out in October to find out about it. Ridwell, the name of this episode. Uh, last week, Thursday night, Amy in Seattle brought up the thing I have been waiting for for at least a decade. If you've been listening for a long time, you may recall back when we were in Tucson, I had really gotten excited about and jazzed about building a chicken coop out of water bottles and uh, used water bottles, discarded water bottles. And by using Adobe or concrete or something, being able to create a structure that had both light coming through, but also was largely well insulated. Because if you have, even if you have the bottles only containing air, that's still insulation. In fact, if you try and put up a wall and have insulation inside and you don't have any air between the, the exterior wall, the insulation, and your drywall, you will have a disaster. You need, you need air. We, we all need air, even houses. So that really got me started uh, being the granddaughter of a tinkerer and the, the daughter of a dad who, you know, built bookshelves and whatever. It's been bugging me for a long time that we aren't doing things like using carbon that comes out of smokestacks for making graphene. Why is this stuff not being captured and reused? I don't know. Part of the problem is because I'm having a hard time hearing about it, as I think we all are. So 
If you ever come across a story where you're like, oh, well, here's one of those things where people are taking cast offs, whether it's cast off food or um, byproducts, please send those stories to me, Heather at Craftlet.com or call 206 350 1642. And let me know because I, number one, I would love to share it with everybody. And number two, some of you like to invest in things like this. And there are things out there to invest in. I know that. Here's one of them. So Amy in Seattle. And again, Amy's in Seattle. God bless. You're so lucky. Uh, this Ridwell so far is only in Atlanta, Austin, the Bay Area. Denver, Colorado, Los Angeles, Minneapolis, St. Paul, totally doesn't surprise me, Portland, and Seattle. It is not in the greater Philadelphia area yet. I have, however, added my name to the list of people who really want it to happen. And so as somebody who's on that list now, I will be alerted when they have enough people in our area to open uh, a center such a cool thing. There was a, a kid and his dad, I think, who were just trying to figure out, like, how do you recycle batteries? There is no easy way to recycle batteries or light bulbs. I spent a week one time trying to figure out where I could take a fluorescent tube, the kind of thing that you just don't want to, you know, accidentally break a fluorescent tube light. How to get it recycled? We don't have a recycling center that I know of here. Nobody knew what to do. I even took it to Home Depot and Lowe's saying, Hi, I was told that I could recycle this here. And they went, Oh, no, we don't take those. Which, you know, maybe it was just because it was in New Jersey. They say everything is legal in New Jersey, but here, here it wasn't. I was so frustrated. So, kid and dad started figuring out, okay, well, what if we go around and pick stuff up from people just to have them call or email and say, okay, I have a, a bag of things that can be recycled, but require a certain amount of specialization because they found a way to do it. And that eventually grew into, let me pay you to come and get these things that I've collected for the last two months that need to go elsewhere. Things that you don't want to just throw into landfill because animals can get caught in it. Thread, fabric, batteries, light bulbs. They have a whole list on their website. It is such a great idea. And so they they have they are creating these hubs for areas where you pay a fee, they come pick stuff up and everybody's happy because your stuff is either being recycled properly or it is being used properly as a piece of a recipe for something else that people can use. I'm so excited. So it's super easy. Ridwell, R-I-D-W-E-L-L dot com. Go on their website. They'll have you type in your address. They will tell you that you are not in their area unless you are uh, living in or near one of the cities that I mentioned before. And then if you are lucky enough to be in one of those cities, they will give you pricing and hook you up with how to do the donations. They even have like specialized bags and boxes and stuff for you. So it is literally stress-free. Uh, if you don't live somewhere where they are like I don't do, don't, you will get uh, an email confirmation that you are signed up. And then as things move along in your area, you'll get notified. And the more people who do it, the more people who request it, the better. So if you, just on your own lonesome, write to them and say, hi, put me on the email list. That's kind of fine. Please tell a friend and give them the website and have them uh, sign up for the request too, because boy, it is an idea whose time came about 40 years ago. So very excited about that. And then next week, for people on the Minra Harker tier, we are going to have our watch party for Aisha. 
And if you liked Clueless, and I know you did, come on, I really, really recommend that this be one of the months where you bump up your Patreon so that you can come and join us for the the watch party. One of the reasons why we have it on a different tier is that it takes a lot to share a movie, uh, a lot of bandwidth, and the more people you have, the worse the bandwidth is. So this is one way for us to control the quality of the video that we share. But it is so charming. And it's it's interesting because while I was watching it the first time, I thought, oh, yeah, this is nice. I mean, it's fine. It has stuck with me. There are parts of it that have stuck with me that they did particularly well. Clueless is, you know, it has its popcorn potato chips moments. Aisha does as well, but it is a lot of fun. And it's lovely to see how it's translated. And translating goes along with the conversation we had started last week on uh, YouTube. And I have an update for you. When Anne Finari 5068 mentioned having watched Clueless and having the conversation with her husband about updating Austin not being as difficult, apparently, as updating Dickens, and I wrote back about Demon Copperhead, we got this also from Anne, Anne's two-step. I shared her com- with her per- permission. I shared her comment onto YouTube, and now I'm going to read it to you. She said, I just listened to episode 672, and I'd like to comment regarding the Dickens comment you received. First, that's an interesting idea, and I think there's a great deal of merit in it. Second, I know of an adaptation, the original Perry Mason television series. There was just one color episode, season nine, episode 21, and it was entitled The Tale of the Twice Told Twist. And yes, as Anne says, you got it. Victor Buono, one of my favorite character actors, played the Fagin character. He's renamed for that episode. And uh, she went on to say this wasn't one of the stories that was written by Earl Stanley Gardner, so it's not got the same flow, but obviously it stuck with me in my mind. Bill Sykes is not renamed. Sadly, he is also not played by Oliver Reed. Swoon. Which I... He's a horrible man, and it's horrible because Swoon, he's the Byronic hero, right? He's... Duh. So awful, but also, damn, Oliver Reed. So, so there's one more for the list from Anne Blanton. So there's one more for the list from Anne. I'm so excited. Anne Finari wrote back again. Heather, I forgot all about Demon Copperhead. Yes, that was a great modernization. I have the Great Expectations adaptation queued up. Still, those are the only ones? I think there's a PhD thesis in here somewhere. Are we really unable to translate Dickens in our heads to modern factory work? My husband and I talked about your theories, and he thinks that there is a there is totally a modern tale of two cities to be written set in Russia. Anyway, makes me appreciate Jane Austen even more. And I thought that is fascinating. And yeah. And then I, I wrote back to Anne saying, I wonder if part of our problem right now is in part compassion fatigue mixed with generalized suspicion of or distaste for anything that feels like melodrama. I hadn't thought about that before, but bringing it up like this, uh, her comment made me think more. And I thought, oh, maybe it's the melodrama. I know Dickens gets criticized for that nowadays, but damn, there is something wrong with someone if they don't cry for days over Joe in Bleak House. And yeah, it Uh, The more I think about it, the more I'm thinking it's not even the Victorian factory work. It's avoiding the melodrama, which I haven't talked to Andrew about. And like I said, I haven't uh, read all of Demon Copperhead yet, so I don't feel like I can comment on it. But maybe it's our problem with melodrama. It's hard to find a way to not sound like a cheese ball or manipulative. And I suppose one of the directors who can walk that razor's edge pretty well is Steven Spielberg. I remember my mom being upset when we were watching E.T. because she felt that her emotions were getting manipulated by someone. And of course, they were. He's also a master of that. So, you know, Spielberg and Dickens both do have that going for them. I don't know. Maybe maybe Spielberg is the only guy who could pull it off right now. Oh, no. But more things to think about. And then we got uh, 
Also a comment from Nats Estrella, who wrote, and this is just a couple days ago, one thing about Emma that I have to keep reminding myself, she is only 20 years old. She's never been anywhere, not even to school. She's had one governess who is now a friend. She has a friend of sorts in Harriet, not a real friend, more like a pet lap dog. I thought, oh, well, this, that's a good way to describe it. Uh, but she feels affection towards her. And her father, quote unquote, could not meet her in conversation. Her sister and brother-in-law just aren't available either because they're in London or they just aren't simpatico, etc. There isn't even mention of reading the newspaper, as far as I recall, which I think there actually is. There's a cut newspaper, a newspaper cutting scene in, I could swear it's in Pride and Prejudice, but you're right. There's nothing about newspapers per se in, in this book. Although there are the elegant extracts from sometime in the previous century, that's the kind of Reader's Digest's short chunks, extracts that are taken from, you know, the best books of the time that people had on their shelves, just very much like Reader's Digest. And Emma never takes Mr. Knightley seriously, although I think that that, that arc, the taking Mr. Knightley seriously, is one of her important character arcs. That's me talking right now, not uh, Nat Sastrea. Because I think the difference between Emma reacting to having made huge errors with Harriet early on versus Box Hill, I think you can see her taking Mr. Knightley more seriously and, and taking her, her fault in these situations more to heart. But I continue. No wonder she seems very juvenile at first, but now begins to seem more like a woman. First Mr. Elton, then Jane Fairfax, then Mrs. Elton, and finally Frank Churchill arrive and expand the Highbury universe beyond anything Emma had, had ever known before. These people are all virtually brand new, and these are the first people in her acquaintance who have actually been anywhere, even excepting Isabella and John, who don't really count. Emma's never even been to visit them in London. They go on to say, I think I forget how young she really is because of the formality of the day, in interactions, in written material, even in the silly games people, adult people, play. And 20-year-olds today are about as different from Emma as if they are members of a different species. And it sure does feel that way. But then we also got this comment from Jen Ginger 4033 they say, phew, finally to Box Hill. I think you're right. One of the reasons this book isn't my favorite is that it does make me uncomfortable. It gives me huge secondhand embarrassment because, yeah, I too have had moments of thoughtless unkindness that I still cringe about years later. And watching Emma go through that moment, especially on rereading, I feel a kind of dread coming up to it. But you're right. It is necessary. Small mistakes, carelessnesses, are easy to excuse, but when you really stick your foot in it, it is much harder to shrug off and forget about. And in order to grow, she has to be convinced that she needs to grow. Until now, she's been much too comfortable in herself. Glad to have gotten a second chance to visit this book with you and all the lovely people who write and call in. And I thought, yeah, yeah, there it is. That's it. So thank you, Jin Ginger. Uh, yeah. I'm with you. And it is really uncomfortable. Even though we're past Box Hill, even though we're in the, the untying of all the knots that Emma has tied, I am still finding myself having cringe moments, not because of her behavior but because she's having to now deal with the repercussions of her behavior in all the different arenas. You know, she has, she has several boxes she needs to check off to redeem herself somewhat. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's a lot, and it's going to take a minute. So today we are doing chapters, volume three, nine and 10, or chapter 45 and 46, if you are numbering them straight through. This stuff is getting much, much lighter as we go through. But just a reminder, 15 minutes is standard polite 
visiting time. Nobody would expect you to spend more than 15 minutes uh, uh, for a normal visit. Everybody had stuff to do. It would be very uncommon for you to go over that 15-minute marker, even with friends. You don't want to overstay your welcome. People have lives, as as probably do you. There is a, a reminder that I am giving you to the famous song from, I think it was William Goldsmith, from The Vicar of Wakefield. And if you're watching YouTube, you will see it on the screen. If you are not, here's how it goes. When lovely woman stoops to folly and finds too late that men betray, what charm can soothe her melancholy? What art can wash her guilt away? The only art her guilt to cover, to hide her shame from every eye, to give repentance to her lover, and wring his bosom, is to die. Which is horrifying. It was considered a sentimental song. I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah. Guys have no responsibility in any of that. But boy, in order to redeem your character, the only thing you can do is die. Okay, you're going to hear a reference to it today that is now the beginning of a Jane Austen snark joke. So when you when you hear that start, when lovely woman stoops to folly, listen for the second half, because there's the snark for you. So, yay, Jane. Broad hems. This is a turn of phrase I do not recall coming across in the last 18 years. Broad hems are, it's, it's a term of art, but it's also a term of use. Women who had to convert dresses into morning gowns and things like that, one of the parts of that was the addition of these broad hems. And by broad, they don't mean wide, they mean tall. Like if you were measuring from your hem up to your waist, it would be eight inches instead of two. And there are pictures from uh, Jane Austen's World blog, which, God, I love this blog. I always wind up finding it again and again and again. It's old. It's it's almost as old as craft lit, but my goodness, the wealth of information here is lovely. So you can you can see the page uh, that I took this from. You can go read the rest of it yourself because it's really quite interesting. But it's the the best explanation of all the different things that women did in Jane Austen's day to deal with mourning. <laughs> Not surprisingly. Women were the ones who really carried the whole morning thing. Like they were the only ones who were expected to change their suits, probably because men were already already wearing dark colored suits. But um, but the the poorer you got, the less able you would be to show any sign of mourning, aside from maybe you know a, a black ribbon around your your sleeve for a while. But if you had the money, uh, this picture will be in the regular show notes, but it's also on the screen on YouTube. The amount of hemming and the amount of restitching that would need to be done was not small. Um, of course, unfortunately, with the death rate, both for... Uh, adult people and certainly uh, younger people, we know that that's, that's why on the average it looks like people didn't live very long back then is because all the children were dying so easily and then women dying in childbirth. But it, it meant that at least for certain periods of your life, you were probably going to need a black dress, at least one, on hand frequently. Um, there are certainly stories that we've come across. I think it's even, isn't it in Gone with the Wind? with Scarlett O'Hara, where the, the women would actually dye their clothes that they were wearing. So it would be fashionable clothing, but dyed black. This is a little bit different. This would be actually 
uh, there's a, a reference to Jane Austen's mother unpicking an entire dress to re-sew into a more modern fashion, but one that could be dyed black and that could the head have the um, and one that could have the broad hems added. You're going to hear a reference to a dry situation. This is Mr. Woodhouse talking about Jane Fairfax and hoping that the when she goes to be a governess that she is in a dry situation, meaning a dry location, because the damp, damp is so bad for you. So that's that's the only thing he's concerned about, obviously. There is a reference to an express that arrives at Randall's. This is kind of like, it would be express post, like you could pay extra to have information sent more quickly. It was possible. You just had to have the money to do it. It is exactly what you think it is. I'm just saying there was, in fact, a system set up to to handle that. Later in our first chapter today, we're going to hear a little bit about Jane Fairfax's health. And if you watched the Emma Midbook live stream, you know that I brought this up then. I can't remember if I brought it up on a, a later episode, but the short version is Jane Austen never expected Jane Fairfax to live terribly long. And today you're going to hear references to Jane's health. One of the things you're going to hear as a phrase is nervous fever. And nervous fever could have been typhoid, which I always get confused with typhus. So if you're watching YouTube on the screen, you will see the definition of typhus versus the definition of typhoid. This will also be in the show notes for you. Uh, The short version is, and I think all we need to know these days is antibiotics to treat both. You're welcome. But the important thing to know is a, a, a nervous fever in Jane's situation is not likely assumed to be typhoid. This would be not like movie wasting disease, some vague unspecified maybe consumption, maybe not thing, but more like what we have seen post-pandemic, people's uh, levels of depression and anxiety that are being exacerbated by what's surrounding them. These are things that can, in fact, absolutely make us sick. What we're eating, if we're just eating or drinking nothing but things that are bad for our body, it can make us sick in very strange, weird ways. I'm not even to get into like what gluten was doing to me before I had to go off of it. So the psychology of the situation that Jane is in, if you start to wrap it up in things like serious depressive streaks, it makes perfect sense. I think it's important it's not hysteria. I'm not seeing anything anywhere talking about this nervous fever as being attributed to, oh, it's just a woman's thing, which means to me, I'm pretty sure that this is a description that could have been used to describe men also suffering from such things. So I thought that was kind of interesting because usually, I mean, usually it's just like, oh, yeah, you're a chick. Well, we know how that goes for you. Too bad. So sad. There will be a reference to Jane's tremulous inequality. There will be a a reference made by Emma to the fact that Jane's handwriting showed such a tremulous inequality that it showed her indisposition plainly. Like Jane's actual handwriting, spelling, cogents, everything was affected by how ill she felt and it it just made it very clear to Emma that this this what happens in in the first chapter today is not Jane playing something is really really very wrong arrowroot i have seen especially since going gluten free i have seen lots of recipes for arrowroot biscuits being cookies arrowroot being added to things it's a starch so it's a thickener I can certainly have found bags of like Bob's Red Mill arrowroot flour. And that is a, a tuber from the, the West Indies. It is very easily digestible and uh, was along with biscuits. It was also being used in uh, other side dishes and jellies and things like that. Again, as a thickener, it made me think, I wonder if you could use arrowroot in a gravy 
for people who can't have flower flower. That could be an interesting experiment if that would make something like gravy and I are not necessarily best friends, but maybe gravy made out of arrowroot. Somebody will know the answer to this. Please write heather at craftlit.com and let me know. <laughs> uh, Momus, M-O-M-U-S. I did not know this guy was even a thing. And I am really regretting having wasted the first 57 years of my life because, oh, wow. Okay. Those of you who have classics degrees and know all these things will know that Momus, M-O-M-U-S, who you will see in the show notes or here on the screen on YouTube, was the god of mockery and satire. Lucian, a Roman writer, told the story that Momus mocked the god Hephaestus, or depending on the, the version that you're reading, or Prometheus, for having done such a bad job creating man because no window was made to their hearts. So you will hear, if somebody could only have seen into her heart, they would have understood better. And that is actually where this, this idea first pops up is, well, Lucian was circa 25 to 80 AD. So yeah, story's been around for a, a minute. Satire and mockery. I know what I'm getting my kids for their birthdays. You will hear in our second chapter today a reference to Mrs. Weston resuming her work. This would have been her needlework. I'm thinking probably her crochet or knitting because she's mid-conversation, but it is a, a sign that she is trying not to make eye contact, that she has hit a part of the conversation that is going to be difficult. And as a consequence, she is using the knitting as a way to not have to make, make any eye contact, a state of mind that I can absolutely empathize with. So, yeah, yeah, I get it. You're going to hear a, a use of the word wonderful that does not fit when you when you hear it. I would be surprised if your brain didn't go, wait, what? And it is wonder, full of wonder. I am amazed. I am astonished. I am full of wonder. It is wonderful that this thing happened. That's, it's just a usage we don't use very often. So there it is. There is a reference that is in quotation marks in the book. And, and it's something that I would bet you dollars to donuts Aaron Ziegler would pick up on. It's a reference to Act 5, Scene 1 of Romeo and Juliet. So this is when everything has hit the fan and it's all about to turn very, very, very bad for everybody. There is a, a line in Romeo's, uh, it's Romeo's speech in Romeo and Juliet. The world is not thy friend, nor the world's law. So you're going to hear it truncated in Austin to the world is not theirs nor the word's law, that they're friendless. And the laws of the world, the world that they have to live within, is also not of benefit to you. It's not, it's not being a good friend to you right now, neither the world nor the law, which is kind of horrible, but also certainly not the first time that we've seen it. Uh, a trick, a prank, a device. This is all the same thing. An invention, it's a, a contrived way to accomplish something. And, and that's how you're going to use the word device. Device used today. And that is it. Let us get on to chapters 45 and 46 of Jane Austen's Emma. If you are listening to your own version, please fast wind to one hour, one minute and 53 seconds. All right, here we go. Volume 3, Chapter 9 Emma's pensive meditations as she walked home were not interrupted, but on entering the parlour she found those who must rouse her. Mr. Knightley and Harriet had arrived during her absence and were sitting with her father. Mr. Knightley immediately got up, and in a manner decidedly graver than usual said, "'I would not go away without seeing you, but I have no time to spare, and therefore must now be gone directly. I am going to London to spend a few days with John and Isabella. Have you anything to send or say, besides the love which nobody carries?' "'Nothing at all. But is not this a sudden scheme?' 
"'Yes, rather. I have been thinking of it some little time.' Emma was sure he had not forgiven her. He looked unlike himself. Time, however, she thought, would tell him that they ought to be friends again. While he stood, as if meaning to go, but not going, her father began his inquiries. "'Well, my dear, and did you get there safely? And how did you find my worthy old friend and her daughter? I dare say they must have been very much obliged to you for coming. Dear Emma has been to call on Mrs. and Miss Bates, Mr. Knightley, as I told you before. She is always so attentive to them.' Emma's colour was heightened by this unjust praise, and with a smile and shake of the head which spoke much, she looked at Mr. Knightley. It seemed as if there were an instantaneous impression in her favour, as if his eyes received the truth from hers, and all that had passed of good in her feelings were at once caught and honoured. He looked at her with a glow of regard. She was warmly gratified, and in another moment still more so, by a little movement of more than common friendliness on his part— he took her hand. Whether she had not herself made the first motion, she could not say. She might, perhaps, have rather offered it, but he took her hand, pressed it, and certainly was on the point of carrying it to his lips, when, from some fancy or other, he suddenly let it go. Why he should feel such a scruple, why he should change his mind when it was all but done, she could not perceive. He would have judged better, she thought, if he had not stopped. The intention, however, was indubitable, and whether it was that his manners had in general so little gallantry, or however else had happened, but she thought nothing became him more. It was with him of so simple, yet so dignified a nature. She could not but recall the attempt with great satisfaction. It spoke such perfect amity. He left them immediately afterwards, gone in a moment. He always moved with the alertness of a mind which could neither be undecided nor dilatory, but now he seemed more sudden than usual in his disappearance. Emma could not regret her having gone to Miss Bates, but she wished she had left her ten minutes earlier. It would have been a great pleasure to talk over Jane Fairfax's situation with Mr. Knightley. Neither would she regret that he should be going to Brunswick Square, for she knew how much his visit would be enjoyed but it might have happened at a better time, and to have had longer notice of it would have been pleasanter. They parted thorough friends, however. She could not be deceived as to the meaning of his countenance and his unfinished gallantry. It was all done to assure her that she had fully recovered his good opinion. He had been sitting with them half an hour, she found. It was a pity that she had not come back earlier. In the hope of diverting her father's thoughts from the disagreeableness of Mr. Knightley's going to London, and going so suddenly, and going on horseback, which she knew would be all very bad, Emma communicated her news of Jane Fairfax, and her dependence on the effect was justified. It supplied a very useful check, interested without disturbing him. He had long made up his mind to Jane Fairfax's going out as governess, and could talk of it cheerfully, but Mr. Knightley's going to London had been an unexpected blow. "'I am very glad indeed, my dear, to hear she is to be so comfortably settled. Mrs. Elton is very good-natured and agreeable, and I dare say her acquaintances are just what they ought to be. I hope it is a dry situation, and that her health will be taken good care of. It ought to be a first object, as I am sure poor Miss Taylor's always was with me. You know, my dear, she is going to be to this new lady what Miss Taylor was to us.' and I hope she'll be better off in one respect, and not be induced to go away after it has been her home so long. The following day brought news from Richmond, to throw everything else into the background. An express arrived at Randall's, to announce the death of Mrs. Churchill. Though her nephew had had no particular reason to hasten back on her account, she had not lived above six-and-thirty hours after his return— a sudden seizure of a different nature from anything foreboded by her general state had carried her off after a short struggle. The great Mrs. Churchill was no more. It was felt as such things must be felt. Everybody had a degree of gravity and sorrow, tenderness towards the departed, solicitude for the surviving friends, and, in a reasonable time, curiosity to know where she would be buried. Goldsmith tells us that when lovely woman stoops to folly, she has nothing to do but to die, and when she stoops to be disagreeable, it is equally to be recommended as a clear of ill fame. 
Mrs. Churchill, after being disliked at least twenty-five years, was now spoken of with compassionate allowances. In one point she was fully justified. She had never been admitted before to be seriously ill. The event acquitted her of all the fancifulness and all the selfishness of imaginary complaints. Poor Mrs. Churchill! No doubt she had been suffering a great deal, more than anybody had ever supposed, and continual pain would try the temper. It was a sad event, a great shock. With all her faults, what would Mr. Churchill do without her? Mr. Churchill's loss would be dreadful indeed. Mr. Churchill would never get over it. Even Mr. Weston shook his head and looked solemn and said, Ah, poor woman, who would have thought it? and resolved that his morning should be as handsome as possible, and his wife sat sighing and moralizing over her broad hems, with a commiseration and good sense, true and steady. How it would affect Frank was among the earliest thoughts of both. It was also a very early speculation with Emma. The character of Mrs. Churchill, the grief of her husband, her mind glanced over them both with awe and compassion and then rested with lightened feelings on how Frank might be affected by the event, how benefited, how freed. She saw in a moment all the possible good. Now an attachment to Harriet Smith would have nothing to encounter. Mr. Churchill, independent of his wife, was feared by nobody, an easy, guidable man to be persuaded into anything by his nephew. All that remained to be wished was, that the nephew should form the attachment, as, with all her good will in the cause, Emma could feel no certainty of its being already formed. Harriet behaved extremely well on the occasion, with great self-command. Whatever she might feel of brighter hope, she betrayed nothing. Emma was gratified to observe such a proof in her of strengthened character, and refrain from any illusion that might endanger its maintenance. They spoke, therefore, of Mrs. Churchill's death with mutual forbearance. Short letters from Frank were received at Randall's, communicating all that was immediately important of their state and plans. Mr. Churchill was better than could be expected, and their first removal, on the departure of the funeral for Yorkshire, was to be to the house of a very old friend in Windsor, to whom Mr. Churchill had been promising a visit the last ten years. At present there was nothing to be done for Harriet. Good wishes for the future were all that could yet be possible on Emma's side. It was a more pressing concern to show attention to Jane Fairfax, whose prospects were closing, while Harriet's opened, and whose engagements now allowed of no delay in any one at Highbury who wished to show her kindness. And with Emma it was grown into a first wish. She had scarcely a stronger regret than for her past coldness, and the person whom she had been so many months neglecting was now the very one on whom she would have lavished every distinction of regard or sympathy— she wanted to be of use to her, wanted to show a value for her society, and testify respect and consideration. She resolved to prevail on her to spend a day at Hartfield. A note was written to urge it. The invitation was refused, and by a verbal message. Miss Fairfax was not well enough to write. And when Mr. Perry called at Hartfield the same morning, it appeared that she was so much indisposed as to have been visited, though against her own consent, by himself, and that she was suffering under severe headaches and a nervous fever to a degree, which made him doubt the possibility of her going to Mrs. Smallridge's at the time proposed. Her health seemed for the moment completely deranged, appetite quite gone, and though there were absolutely no alarming symptoms, nothing touching the pulmonary complaint, which was the standing apprehension of the family, Mr. Perry was uneasy about her. He thought she had undertaken more than she was equal to, and that she felt it so herself, though she would not own it. Her spirits seemed overcome. Her present home, he could not but observe, was unfavourable to a nervous disorder. Confined always to one room, he could have wished it otherwise, and her good aunt, though his very old friend, he must acknowledge to be not the best companion for an invalid of that description. Her care and attention could not be questioned. They were, in fact, only too great. He very much feared that Miss Fairfax derived more evil than good from them. Emma listened with the warmest concern, grieved for her more and more, and looked around eager to discover some way of being useful. To take her, be it only an hour or two, from her aunt, to give her change of air and scene and quiet rational conversation, even for an hour or two, might do her good. And the following morning she wrote again to say, in the most feeling language she could command, that she would call for her in the carriage at any hour that Jane would name, mentioning that she had Mr. Perry's decided opinion in favour of such exercise for his patient. The answer was only in this short note. Miss Fairfax's compliments and thanks. 
but is quite unequal to any exercise. Emma felt that her own note had deserved something better, but it was impossible to quarrel with words, whose tremulous inequality showed in disposition so plainly, and she thought only of how she might best counteract this unwillingness to be seen or assisted. In spite of the answer, therefore, she ordered the carriage, and drove to Mrs. Bates's, in the hope that Jane would be induced to join her, but it would not do. Miss Bates came to the carriage door, all gratitude, and agreeing with her most earnestly in thinking an airing might be of the greatest service, and everything that message could do was tried, but all in vain. Miss Bates was obliged to return without success. Jane was quite unpersuadable. The mere proposal of going out seemed to make her worse. Emma wished she could have seen her, and tried her own powers. But almost before she could hint the wish, Miss Bates made it appear that she had promised her niece on no account to let Miss Woodhouse in. Indeed, the truth was that poor dear Jane could not bear to see anybody, anybody at all. Mrs. Elton, indeed, could not be denied, and Mrs. Cole had made such a point, and Mrs. Perry had said so much, but except them Jane would really see nobody. Emma did not want to be classed with the Mrs. Eltons, the Mrs. Perrys, and the Mrs. Coles, who would force themselves anywhere. Neither could she feel any right of preference herself. She submitted, therefore, and only questioned Miss Bates farther, as to her niece's appetite and diet, which she longed to be able to assist. On that subject poor Miss Bates was very unhappy, and very communicative. Jane would hardly eat anything. Mr. Perry recommended nourishing food, but everything they could command, and never had anybody such good neighbours, was distasteful. Emma, on reaching home, called the housekeeper directly to an examination of her stores, and some arrow-root of very superior quality was speedily dispatched to Miss Bates with a most friendly note. In half an hour the arrow-root was returned, with a thousand thanks from Miss Bates, but— Dear Jane would not be satisfied without its being sent back. It was a thing she could not take, and, moreover, she insisted on her saying that she was not at all in want of anything. When Emma afterwards heard that Jane Fairfax had been seen wandering about the meadows at some distance from Highbury, on the afternoon of the very day on which she had, under the plea of being unequal to any exercise, so peremptorily refused to go out with her in the carriage, she could have no doubt— putting everything together, that Jane was resolved to receive no kindness from her. She was sorry, very sorry. Her heart was grieved for a state which seemed but the more pitiable from this sort of irritation of spirits, inconsistency of action, and inequality of powers, and it mortified her that she was given so little credit for proper feeling, or esteemed so little worthy as a friend. But she had the consolation of knowing that her intentions were good, and of being able to say to herself that could Mr. Knightley have been privy to all her attempts of assisting Jane Fairfax, could he even have seen into her heart, he would not, on this occasion, have found anything to reprove. End of chapter 9 Volume 3, Chapter 10 One morning, about ten days after Mrs. Churchill's decease, Emma was called downstairs to Mr. Weston, who— could not stay five minutes, and wanted particularly to speak with her. He met her at the parlour door, and hardly asking her how she did, in the natural key of his voice, sunk it immediately to say, unheard by her father, "'Can you come to Randall's at any time this morning? Do, if it be possible. Mrs. Weston wants to see you. She must see you.' "'Is she unwell?' "'No, no, not at all. Only a little agitated.' She would have ordered the carriage and come to you, but she must see you alone, and that you know—' Nodding towards her father. Ahem. <clears throat> can you come? Certainly. This moment, if you please. It is impossible to refuse what you ask in such a way. But what can be the matter? Is she really not ill? Depend upon me, but ask no more questions. You will know it all in time. The most unaccountable business. But hush, hush. To guess what all this meant was impossible even for Emma. Something really important seemed announced by his looks, but as her friend was well, she endeavoured not to be uneasy, and settling it with her father that she would take her walk now, she and Mr. Weston were soon out of the house together, and on their way at a quicker pace for Randall's. "'Now,' said Emma, when they were fairly beyond the sweep-gates, "'now, Mr. Weston, do let me know what has happened.' "'No, no,' he gravely replied. "'Don't ask me.' I promised my wife to leave it all to her. She will break it to you better than I can. Do not be impatient, Emma. It will all come out too soon. Break it to me? cried Emma, standing still with terror. Good God! Mr. Weston, tell me at once. Something has happened in Brunswick Square. I know it has. 
tell me, I charge you, tell me this moment what it is. No, indeed, you are mistaken. Mr. Weston, do not trifle with me. Consider how many of my dearest friends are now in Brunswick Square. Which of them is it? I charge you by all that is sacred not to attempt concealment. Upon my word, Emma. Your word? Why not your honour? Why not say upon your honour, that it has nothing to do with any of them? Good heavens! What can be to be broke to me that does not relate to one of that family? Upon my honour, said he very seriously, it does not. It is not in the smallest degree connected with any human being of the name of Knightley. Emma's courage returned, and she walked on. I was wrong, he continued, in talking of its being broke to you. I should not have used the expression. In fact, it does not concern you. It concerns only myself. That is, we hope. <laughs> in short, my dear Emma, there is no occasion to be so uneasy about it. I don't say that it is not a disagreeable business, but things might be much worse. If we walk fast, we shall soon be at Randall's. Emma found that she must wait, and now it required little effort. She asked no more questions, therefore, merely employed her own fancy, and that soon pointed out to her the probability of its being some money concern, something just come to light, of a disagreeable nature in the circumstances of the family, something which the late event at Richmond had brought forward. Her fancy was very active. Half a dozen natural children, perhaps, and poor Frank cut off— this, though very undesirable, would be no matter of agony to her. It inspired little more than an animating curiosity. "'Who is that gentleman on horseback?' said she, as they proceeded, speaking more to assist Mr. Weston in keeping his secret, than with any other view. "'I do not know. One of the Otways. Not Frank. It is not Frank, I assure you. You will not see him. He is half-way to Windsor by this time.' "'Has your son been with you, then?' "'Oh, yes. Did not you know?' "'Well, well, never mind.' For a moment he was silent, and then added in a tone much more guarded and demure, "'Yes, Frank came over this morning just to ask us how we did.' They hurried on, and were speedily at Randall's. "'Well, my dear,' said he as they entered the room, "'I have brought her, and now I hope you will soon be better. I shall leave you together. There is no use in delay. I shall not be far off if you want me.' and Emma distinctly heard him add in a lower tone before he quitted the room, "'I have been as good as my word. She has not the least idea.' Mrs. Weston was looking so ill, and had an air of so much perturbation, that Emma's uneasiness increased, and the moment they were alone she eagerly said, "'What is it, my dear friend? Something of a very unpleasant nature, I find, has occurred. Do let me know directly what it is. I have been walking all this way in complete suspense.' We both abhor suspense. Do not let mine continue longer. It will do you good to speak of your distress, whatever it may be. Have you indeed no idea? said Mrs. Weston in a trembling voice. Cannot you, my dear Emma, cannot you form a guess as to what you are to hear? So far as that it relates to Mr. Frank Churchill, I do guess. You are right. It does relate to him, and I will tell you directly. Resuming her work and seeming resolved against looking up, he has been here this very morning, on a most extraordinary errand. It is impossible to express our surprise. He came to speak to his father on a subject, to announce an attachment. She stopped to breathe. Emma thought first of herself, and then of Harriet. More than an attachment, indeed, resumed Mrs. Weston. An engagement, a positive engagement. What will you say, Emma? What will anybody say? when it is known that Frank Churchill and Miss Fairfax are engaged, nay, that they have been long engaged. Emma even jumped with surprise, and horror-struck exclaimed, "'Jane Fairfax! Good God! You are not serious! You do not mean it!' "'You may well be amazed,' returned Mrs. Weston, still averting her eyes and talking on with eagerness, that Emma might have time to recover. "'You may well be amazed,' but it is even so. There has been a solemn engagement between them ever since October, formed at Weymouth, and kept a secret from everybody, not a creature knowing it but themselves, neither the Campbells nor her family nor his. It is so wonderful that, though perfectly convinced of the fact, it is yet almost incredible to myself. I can hardly believe it. I thought I knew him. Emma scarcely heard what was said. Her mind was divided between two ideas— her own former conversations with him about Miss Fairfax, 
and poor Harriet. And for some time she could only exclaim and require confirmation, repeated confirmation. Well, said she at last, trying to recover herself, this is a circumstance which I must think of at least half a day before I can at all comprehend it. What? Engaged to her all the winter, before either of them came to Highbury? Engaged since October, secretly engaged. It has hurt me, Emma, very much. It has hurt his father equally. Some part of his conduct we cannot excuse. Emma pondered a moment, and then replied, I will not pretend not to understand you, and to give you all the relief in my power, be assured that no such effect has followed his attentions to me as you are apprehensive of. Mrs. Weston looked up, afraid to believe, but Emma's countenance was as steady as her words. That you may have less difficulty in believing this boast of my present perfect indifference, she continued, I will farther tell you that there was a period in the early part of our acquaintance when I did like him, when I was very much disposed to be attached to him, nay, was attached, and how it came to cease is perhaps the wonder. Fortunately, however, it did cease. I have really for some time past, for at least these three months, cared nothing about him. You may believe me, Mrs. Weston, that is the simple truth. Mrs. Weston kissed her with tears of joy, and when she could find utterance, assured her that this protestation had done her more good than anything else in the world could do. Mr. Weston will be almost as much relieved as myself, said she. On this point we have been wretched. It was our darling wish that you might be attached to each other, and we were persuaded that it was so. Imagine what we have been feeling on your account. I have escaped, and that I should escape may be a matter of grateful wonder to you and myself. But this does not acquit him, Mrs. Weston, and I must say that I think him greatly to blame. What right had he to come among us with affection and faith engaged, and with manners so very disengaged? What right had he to endeavour to please, as he certainly did, to distinguish any one young woman with persevering attention, as he certainly did, while he really belonged to another? How could he tell what mischief he might be doing? How could he tell that he might not be making me in love with him? Very wrong, very wrong indeed. From something that he said, my dear Emma, I rather imagine. And how could she bear such behaviour, composure with a witness, to look on while repeated attentions were offering to another woman before her face and not resent it? That is a degree of placidity which I can neither comprehend nor respect. There were misunderstandings between them, Emma. He said so expressly. He had not much time to enter into much explanation. He was here only a quarter of an hour, and in a state of agitation which did not allow the full use even of the time he could stay. But that there had been misunderstandings, he decidedly said. The present crisis, indeed, seemed to be brought on by them, and those misunderstandings might possibly arise from the impropriety of his conduct. Impropriety? Oh, Mrs. Weston, it is too calm a censure— much, much beyond impropriety. It has sunk him. I cannot say how it has sunk him, in my opinion. So unlike what a man should be. None of that upright integrity, that strict adherence to truth and principle, that disdain of trick and littleness, which a man should display in every transaction of his life. Nay, dear Emma, now I must take his part, for though he has been wrong in this instance, I have known him long enough to answer for his having many, very many good qualities, and— Good God! cried Emma, not attending to her. Mrs. Smallridge, too, Jane actually on the point of going as governess. What could he mean by such horrible indelicacy, to suffer her to engage herself, to suffer her even to think of such a measure? He knew nothing about it, Emma— on this article I can fully acquit him. It was a private resolution of hers, not communicated to him, or at least not communicated in a way to carry conviction. Till yesterday I know he said he was in the dark as to her plans. They burst on him, I do not know how, but by some letter or message, and it was the discovery of what she was doing, of this very project of hers, which determined him to come forward at once, own it all to his uncle, throw himself on his kindness, and, in short, put an end to the miserable state of concealment that had been carrying on so long. Emma began to listen better. "'I am to hear from him soon,' continued Mrs. Weston. He told me at parting that he should write soon, and he spoke in a manner which seemed to promise me many particulars that could not be given now— let us wait, therefore, for this letter, 
It may bring many extenuations. It may make many things intelligible and excusable, which now are not to be understood. Don't let us be severe. Don't let us be in a hurry to condemn him. Let us have patience. I must love him. And now that I am satisfied on one point, the one material point, I am sincerely anxious for its all turning out well, and ready to hope that it may. They must both have suffered a great deal under such a system of secrecy and concealment. His sufferings, replied Emma dryly, do not appear to have done him much harm. Well, and how did Mr. Churchill take it? Most favourably for his nephew, gave his consent with scarcely a difficulty. Conceive what the events of a week have done in that family. While poor Mrs. Churchill yet lived, I suppose there could not have been a hope, a chance, a possibility. But scarcely are her remains at rest in the family vault, than her husband is persuaded to act exactly opposite to what she would have required. What a blessing it is, when undue influence does not survive the grave. He gave his consent with very little persuasion. Ah, thought Emma, he would have done as much for Harriet. This was settled last night, and Frank was off with the light this morning. He stopped at Highbury, at the Bates's, I fancy, some time, and then came on hither, but was in such a hurry to get back to his uncle, to whom he is just now more necessary than ever, that, as I tell you, he could stay with us but a quarter of an hour. He was very much agitated, very much indeed, to a degree that made him appear quite a different creature from anything I had ever seen before. In addition to all the rest, there had been the shock of finding her so very unwell, which he had had no previous suspicion of, and there was every appearance of his having been feeling a great deal. "'And do you really believe the affair to have been carrying on with such perfect secrecy? The Campbells, the Dixons, did none of them know of the engagement?' Emma could not speak the name of Dixon without a little blush. "'None. Not one. He positively said that it had been known to no being in the world but their two selves.' "'Well,' said Emma, "'I suppose we shall gradually grow reconciled to the idea, and I wish them very happy. But I shall always think it a very abominable sort of proceeding. What has it been but a system of hypocrisy and deceit, espionage and treachery, to come among us with professions of openness and simplicity, and such a league in secret to judge us all? Here have we been, the whole winter and spring, completely duped, fancying ourselves all on an equal footing of truth and honour, with two people in the midst of us who may have been carrying round, comparing and sitting in judgment on sentiments and words that were never meant for both to hear. They must take the consequence, if they have heard each other spoken of in a way not perfectly agreeable. "'I am quite easy on that head,' replied Mrs. Weston. "'I am very sure that I never said anything of either to the other, which both might not have heard. "'You are in luck. Your only blunder was confined to my ear, when you imagined a certain friend of ours was in love with the lady. "'True. But as I have always had a thoroughly good opinion of Miss Fairfax, I never could, under any blunder, have spoken ill of her, and as to speaking ill of him, there I must have been safe.' At this moment Mr. Weston appeared at a little distance from the window, evidently on the watch. His wife gave him a look which invited him in, and while he was coming round, added, "'Now, dearest Emma, let me entreat you to say and look everything that may set his heart at ease, and incline him to be satisfied with the match. Let us make the best of it, and, indeed, almost everything may be fairly said in her favour. It is not a connection to gratify, but if Mr. Churchill does not feel that, why should we?' and it may be a very fortunate circumstance for him, for Frank, I mean, that he should have attached himself to a girl of such steadiness of character and good judgment as I have always given her credit for, and still am disposed to give her credit for, in spite of this one great deviation from the strict rule of right, and how much may be said in her situation for even that error. "'Much indeed,' cried Emma feelingly. "'If a woman can ever be excused for thinking only of herself, it is in a situation like Jane Fairfax's, of such one may almost say, that the world is not theirs, nor the world's law. She met Mr. Weston on his entrance, with a smiling countenance, exclaiming, "'A very pretty trick you've been playing me upon my word. This was a device, I suppose, to sport with my curiosity, and exercise my talent of guessing. But you really frightened me. I thought you had lost half your property, at least. And here, instead of its being a matter of condolence, it turns out to be one of congratulation.' I congratulate you, Mr. Weston, with all my heart, on the prospect of having one of the most lovely and accomplished young women in England for your daughter. 
A glance or two between him and his wife convinced him that all was as right as this speech proclaimed, and its happy effect on his spirits was immediate. His air and voice recovered their usual briskness, he shook her heartily and gratefully by the hand, and entered on the subject in a manner to prove that he now only wanted time and persuasion to think the engagement no very bad thing. His companion suggested only what could palliate imprudence or smooth objections, and by the time they had talked it all over together, and he had talked it all over again with Emma in their walk back to Hartfield, he was become perfectly reconciled, and not far from thinking it the very best thing that Frank could possibly have done. End of chapter 10All right, so in, today, in today's chapters, whew, a lot happened. It was lovely that Knightley and Harriet were there. Harriet's pretty much forgotten. Knightley, good. Emma is not going to be stressed about Knightley, and yet he is uh, taking off for whatever reason. It's not hard to think of why, but you might not be thinking the right thing yet. You might be, but you might not be. Uh, the second thing that cracked me up was Mr. Woodhouse talking about Mrs. Elton being very good-natured and agreeable. Like, oh, dude, you are just not a good judge of character. Nobody should trust you when talking about people. Ever. We know, we know that all Mrs. Churchill has done is complain about being ill. And apparently those around her, now that she has, she's no longer in the picture, are, are content to say, oh, you know, she she never complained a day in her life. Huh. So the way Jane Austen deals with that is Mrs. Churchill, after being disliked at least 25 years, was now spoken of with compassion and allowances. At one point, she was fully justified. She had never been admitted before to be seriously ill, meaning everybody just assumed that she was really just whining and complaining that she wasn't actually sick. And now at least she's she's dead, but she has the benefit aha, of people realizing that she was not making it up. So, so good. Ah! Um, but, <laughs> but one of the annotations brings up something. There is a whole story. You will be able to follow this story on your own if you so wish. There's a screenshot on the screen here on YouTube. If you are listening and you look at the show notes, you will be able to see a picture of this. Spike Milligan from The Goon Show, who is awesome. He and Peter Sellers and, oh my gosh, now I can't remember his name. Dudley Moore, I think. Very young Dudley Moore. I think they were all in The, the Goon Show together. If you get a chance to listen to any of them, try and make sure that they have subtitles if you're not British because the recordings aren't great and they can be very hard to follow. But Spike Milligan, very, very funny guy, has an interesting history all his own. Not going to go into it, but his epitaph on his tombstone was, I told you I was ill. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The even funnier part of this, he died in 2002, is that he was, he's buried in a, a graveyard, a Catholic graveyard, and they're like, oh, no, you can't put that on a tombstone. And he's like, all right. So his, his family steps in and they're like, well, we've got to figure out a way around this because he, he needs to have this on his tombstone. So what did they do? They wrote it in Gaelic. So it was on his tombstone in Gaelic, and it says, in fact, I told you I was ill. Now, the controversy was back in, I think, 2010, 2012, somewhere around there. His third wife wanted to be buried uh, next to him and wanted to have her name added to his headstone. If you look at the picture, there's no room for that. So she was actually going to have that tombstone recut with a, you know, lying and loving harmony or something added. And Spike Milligan's kids from previous marriages were like, oh, no, she didn't. That's not going to happen. And it was a lot. Apparently, she 
has been buried there, but the headstone has not been changed. Or at least uh, if it was recut, it was recut with the original Gaelic Gaelic statement on it, I think. If anybody has uh, further updates, because that was the last thing I heard from 2012. That was the last thing that I could find about it from 2012. If there is an update beyond that and you know about it or you've been to the grave star, graveside of Spike Milligan, please let me know. Because if, oh man, if that gravestone just got removed, I'm going to have my heart broken. But I would rather know the truth and be heartbroken than not. I also love that Mr. Weston's response to Mrs. Churchill dying. Oh, poor woman. Who would have thought? Even Mr. Weston, who had nothing nice to say about her. I mean, he could say it politely, but he had nothing nice to say about her in general. Goes to standard upright politeness in a situation like this, which I just love. So the uh, I mentioned before the nervous the nervous fever, but the the most overt statement of Jane Austen's in the text itself, not from her letters, about Jane Fairfax's health actually comes in this chapter, and that is the line that um, there were no alarming symptoms, nothing touching the pulmonary complaint, which was the standing apprehension of the family. That's everything that we get in the book. In letters, she talked more about thinking that Jane Fairfax was not terribly long for the world. Uh, Emma, I didn't say this beforehand because I didn't want to give away too much. Emma does say when she's talking about, oh my gosh, something must be going wrong with Frank and and Mrs. Churchill and potential inheritances, the way she phrases it is something which the late event at Richmond had brought forward, meaning when the will was read, all of a sudden, this new information is brought forward, like half a dozen natural children, which is half a dozen children that were born out of wedlock to Mr. Churchill, but who now have a claim, a direct claim on the family's fortune. That's all she's she's getting at, is that the will may have revealed all of this, and that and Frank would have been uh, cut off, would have been disinherited which obviously is not what happened. Mr. Churchill seems to be a, a lovely man and also not the father of a bunch of illegitimate children. Emma goes off the handle a bit being critical of Frank Churchill, which I think is perfectly in character for her. She kind of you know flies off the handle and Mrs. Weston is the one who, who pulls her back. At the same time, I think... More of us are probably with her in her taking offense to the situation. And I think Jane Austen does too, because the the lines, what right had he to endeavor to please, as he certainly did, to distinguish any one young woman with persevering attention, as he certainly did, while he really belonged to another. And if you think back to Sense and Sensibility, and Eleanor, oh my gosh, now I can't remember his name. Edward? Is it Edward? Uh, I'm not going to go look it up. But either way, he clearly likes Eleanor, but not clearly the way Frank presents himself as being interested in Emma. And in fact, the reason I bring up that comparison is because in sensib sensibility, it is done correctly. Like, I can't get involved with you. I am promised to somebody else. But gosh darn it, I really wish I could. Versus Frank's laying out of a false situation, which is really, it is reprehensible. And thank God, just thank God that Emma, by by the time she thought about it for 15 minutes, realized she was not, not interested. And, and, and clearly was not lying about that. She really was not just saying to herself, oh, well. I'm not really into him. No, she really wasn't. And now we know that she wasn't just saying that, which also means that her trying to set Harriet up sort of or approving setting Harriet up with Frank was also not contrived. She really thought it was a good idea because she still hasn't grown up yet. Another uh, Aaron Ziegler Shakespeare reference to uh, this time Julius Caesar Act 3, Scene 1, which 
Aaron Ziegler's going to do next. Julius Caesar, I'm so excited. I used to teach that play, so I'm, I'm very excited. It's not a perfect play, but it's an important one. In Act 3, Scene 1, at the funeral, Mark Antony says, The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. And you have a flip-flop of that here, that Mrs. Churchill would have prevented Frank from ever coming clean about Jane. But her husband, they're all worried that her husband believes the same way that Mrs. Churchill does. And no, no, he doesn't. What a blessing it is when undue influence does not survive the grave. All of the bad influences from Mrs. Churchill. Gone. Gone. Didn't survive the grave. Yay. What a great place to stop. <laughs> All right. You have a great week. I will talk to you soon. We will have more fun with Emma next week. And if you're there for the watch party, that will be the night of Thursday, September 26 at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. We will uh, hop on the Discord and watch Asia. If you do join Patreon or a membership level specifically to be able to do that, make sure you get in touch with us before the day of the event so that we can make sure that you're on Discord for that. There you go. Um, that's it. Have a great one. I will talk to you soon. Take care. Bye. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes, thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craftlit channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that Craftlet lives. It's, it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome. Makers and readers. And people who hadn't been readers before but are now. I like that. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you.